Hello again, everybody. In this section, we're going to talk about Chapter 9, Early Childhood Cognitive Development, this time focusing on Vygotsky, who you may recall is a sociocultural theorist who differs in many ways from how he felt about development than Piaget. So you may recall that to Vygotsky, learning happens in a social context. In fact, in his theories, every aspect of a child's development of cognition is embedded within the social context and thus is shaped by other people. So to Vygotsky, while a child may have the neurological substrates, kind of the um, foundations for learning, it isn't until the child comes into contact with caring adults or peers that the child can put that brain to use and actually learn functional skills. So Vygotsky really valued what we might call an apprenticeship model. The idea that each of us learns and grows by being stimulated by somebody else in our environment who's more skillful or more experienced than we are in a particular area. To Vygotsky, providing young children with adults who act as mentors is particularly powerful in promoting their learning of not only important cognitive skills, but also language skills, social skills, emotional skills, and down the line, abstract thinking. Mentors or adults who are in the role of teacher therefore have the role of presenting challenges, things that are just outside the child's comfort zone, offering some assistance, if possible kind of invisible assistance, so that the child can still perceive that she is actually learning about the task on her own. So the adult needs to not take over that their assistance is so overwhelming. Those mentors will help to deepen the knowledge that the child has about a skill or an area and encourage the child to be motivated, particularly if the material becomes more challenging and the child has to bring more work in order to understand the content. There are two very important terms I'd like for you to know when it comes to understanding Vygotsky's theories of social learning. The first is scaffolding. This is the process by which people learn from others, usually these mentors, um, who guide their experiences and guide their exploration. So scaffolding is when an adult joins a child in learning a new task and the adult provides just enough help. Maybe it's a physical prompt. Maybe it's modeling or showing the child how to do it. Maybe it's starting a task but having the child finish it. So the adult provides just enough support for the child to complete the new task or skill successfully. This will then encourage motivation when the child comes back to the task. The adult can reduce the prompting, in other words, scaffold a little bit less, and hopefully the child can still demonstrate competence. To Vygotsky, this is exactly how learning should happen. Adults and children working together in collaboration so that the adult is constantly matching where the child is and providing just enough challenge that the child is uh, stretching his or her potential. In fact, to be effective at scaffolding, the adult needs to have a pretty good intuitive understanding of what Vygotsky called the Zone of Proximal Development, or the ZPD. The Zone of Proximal Development is basically this idea that if you picture uh, like a big circle, and everything within the circle includes the skills that a child has, all of the concepts and uh, knowledge the child has mastered. If the adult only provides learning opportunities within the circle, within that area where the child's already mastered everything, there's going to be very little motivation on behalf of the child to continue. There's nothing new here, nothing to be gained. If, on the other hand, the adult introduced tasks or skills that are like two miles out from the circle, that are way beyond the child's grasp, that will also result in very little learning because the child won't have the foundational skills to be able to make it a useful part of their repertoire. So overestimating what the child's ready to learn, having a skill target that's way far from what's familiar, is also not effective. To Vygotsky, the sweet spot of encouraging learning in a child is to think about the zone of proximal development. 
This is the area that is just outside of that circle of mastery, but not way far out. It's just enough challenge that the child can stay engaged, that the child senses a curiosity about what's to be learned, hasn't mastered it yet, but also views the task as somewhat doable. So for example, if I were learning a new language and you were to say, okay, you're going to learn it by uh, giving a speech tomorrow in Russian to your 310 class, that would be an example of a, of a task that is way outside of my competency area, way outside of my zone of proximal development. If you were trying to teach me Russian, a better way to go about it might be to show me a TV show I'm very familiar with and have some captions on the bottom that include both English and Russian words. That way I'm just getting a bit more familiar and there's an attempt to bridge what I know with what is a little bit novel. So the zone of proximal development is an important Vygotskyan concept because it guides the adult mentors on to think really, really carefully, developmentally, about where to set the target for what they're trying to teach the child and to always try to have it be just challenging enough. Now in, the, in his social learning theories, Vygotsky also identifies a few um, sort of cognitive errors, you might call them, uh, Pia, which we covered in Piaget's uh, lecture earlier, or my lecture on Piaget earlier. You may recall we talked about conservation. A young child's ability to reason about objects is somewhat limited by what Piaget called their thought errors. Well, Vygotsky has um, a set of learning errors that he will discuss as well. For example, he describes a phenomena referred to as over-imitation. And this is when young children will tend to imitate or copy an action even if it's not a relevant part of the skill that they're trying to learn. So early on, Vygotsky thinks that because learning happens in a social context, children are going to learn a lot by watching what others do, but young children may not yet reason or think through why the adults are doing what they do and therefore might imitate a lot of behaviors that aren't really functional or useful but appear to be tied to something that is functional or useful. So it's pretty common for young children to imitate irrelevant actions and need to be guided to use the skill of imitation in only functional areas. Um, for example, you might recall when we did our first class and I showed you all some videos from YouTube, there were a group of, uh, I think it was five five-year-old boys inside a tent. The first boy walked out of the tent and tripped. The second boy walked out of the tent and actually tripped. The third boy walked out the tent, saw how the other two had tripped, so he then tripped. That's the situation of choosing to imitate even when it isn't functional to do so. And it's pretty common in young learners. It actually is an indicator of their social motivation. Vygotsky also wrote a lot about how important language is as a bridge between people. And some of his later work talked a lot about how improvements in language, which is really a symbolic system, as Piaget would refer to it, can not only help a child understand how to organize language ideas, but they can also help a child understand abstract principles um, that might be related to, say, science, engineering, math, and technology. So our ability to manipulate symbols doesn't just help us with literacy skills, it can form the foundation for scientific reasoning. This is because, to Vygotsky, there's a phenomena called private speech, which he suggested has a lot to do with promoting learning and actually providing practice opportunities for children when adults or uh, peers are not available so that learning can continue in solitary play. Private speech is when a young child talks herself through a routine, talks to herself while doing a new skill. This is very developmentally appropriate and actually does help a child to practice a new skill and make it part of their repertoire. Language also advances thinking, according to Vygotsky, by allowing us to tap into people in our social environment. One of the things that parents of four-year-olds will tell you is that they ask hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions each day. 
and it's an important part of a parent or teacher's role to try to address those questions because as a child asks a question one can probably assume they're motivated to want to hear an answer and in order to teach a new skill we often want to capitalize on that motivation so language advances thinking by allowing for social mediation between child and adults so that new questions can be answered. Interestingly, people who are studying the development of scientific reasoning have suggested that early childhood is an important time period to introduce math and science and to introduce the symbols that are parts of these disciplines, just like we introduce letters as a part of literacy development. Vygotsky also suggests that language is a critical tool for being able to understand complex systems such as math. So early on, understanding one-to-one -one correspondence is a critical part of early childhood. What I mean by one-to-one -one correspondence is the idea that when you're counting things, you assign one number to each object that you're counting. So early on, children will often learn to count by touching the object and saying the number. And sometimes, if their touching is slower than their counting, they will make mistakes in this area and need to be gently corrected. In the early childhood years, language enables us to learn the foundational skills that will lead to being able to manipulate numbers or even understand how the physical world operates. This is the foundation to time and dates for example. If you've spent any time in a preschool classroom you've noticed that they almost always have a time in their day where they sit around a circle look at the calendar and begin to orient to uh, the date the time even the weather. So beginning to understand how temperatures work can occur during this time. Understanding that um, numbers are higher than other numbers, lower than other numbers. This relativity that comes with the symbols of math can be taught in the early childhood years. Vygotsky also wrote a lot about the different kinds of theories that children will develop in early childhood in order to understand their world. So when we talk about children's theories, we're talking about ways of reasoning that they count on in order to solve problems. So one of the theories that becomes particularly important for social development is referred to as theory of mind. This is a term which is described to describe, which is um, supposed to describe the understanding that emerges around the age of four or five, which is that other people have their own thoughts and feelings and that it's an important part of social interaction to get the point to the point where cognitively you can understand I have my perspective on this another person has a different perspective on this. It can be um, a bit slow to develop children don't always understand what other people know or what other people see or how other people feel until about the age of four or five. One of the ways that they test theory of mind in psychology labs is to do a task which we might refer to as the crayon box task. So what happens is one adult is with a child and they open up a crayon box, like a Crayola box, like you see on your slide, and they see, of course, about 20 different crayons. Then the adult says, let's take two of these crayons out and let's put a piece of candy in here and then they cover up the crayon box, they shut the box, they bring in another adult, and the first adult says to the child, what do you think this second person will think is in the crayon box? Now, children who do not yet have theory of mind will say that the second adult, who did not actually see the candy get hidden in the box, the child will still say, they'll think there's candy in the box because they can't yet understand that the new adult doesn't know the same thing as the child. The new adult was not in the room when the candy was put in. After about the age of four, the child can correctly say, oh, he's going to think it's all crayons. He won't know there's candy in there. So theory of mind is all about understanding that each individual person has their own perspective and it has cognitive aspects 
as well as emotional aspects and is thought to be kind of the beginning point of developing empathy. So what can be done to strengthen theory of mind in young children? Well, part of it is just biological. We have to have that prefrontal cortex growing and developing in a reasonable way over time, and it really isn't until the child's about four that their brain is connected well enough for this kind of reasoning to occur on a regular basis. But it's also important that the child have practice, experience, and be able to play with these concepts in order to learn them. As we've mentioned before, play is the work of the young child. So if you think of a common game like hide-and-seek, that's actually a game of theory of mind because the person is trying to hide in a place that they think the other person won't be able to see and a child who hides way out in the open so that the adult could walk by and see them right away it's demonstrating a lack of theory of mind. Whereas a child who recognizes that they need to put a blanket over their heads is showing that they uh, understand that the adult can, from their own perspective, see them unless they cover up. So practice, experience, maturation, all important, and context and culture are going to matter. Early on, as we're helping a child understand the thoughts and feelings of others, adults are often coaching the child through real-life experience. Say, for example, one three-year-old takes the toy of another three-year-old, the adult may come in and do some teaching. Basically say to the first three-year-old, the culprit, look at Matthew, he's crying, he's sad. When you take his toy, he feels sad. That kind of narration is going to help the child to understand that other people have their own thoughts and feelings and that we can learn how to pay attention to those. Between the ages of 3 and 12 then, children become better and better that you have to embed a young child in a social context with peer partners, with adults who are responsive, with people who will look at the child as an apprentice and basically mentor the child to learn new skills, either through play or through more direct instruction. So as you're thinking about Vygotsky versus Piaget, remember that Piaget speaks in terms of stages Vygotsky has a more continuous, less stage-like idea about development. Piaget focuses on the importance of symbolic thought in this period. And Vygotsky focuses on the importance of learning within that social context. So with that in mind, we're going to close Section 2, and our next part will open up again on early childhood cognition. Thank you.